Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Why Pentecost Sunday? Why do we celebrate Pentecost Sunday? I'm glad you asked. Pentecost Sunday, it's, a, it's an amazing day. Amen. We celebrate the outpouring of the gift of the Holy Ghost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord, just like we are today, and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all of the house where they, the Bible goes on, and cloven tongues appeared unto them, and they, they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. The Bible says, and it did not happen just for the people in Acts chapter 2, but the Bible tells us that it is for you. Somebody say, that's me. And your children. Somebody look at your kids and say, that means you. And all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And so we celebrate today the fact that God poured out His Spirit in the Bible, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, but he's still pouring it out today. He's still filling people with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that he didn't leave me by myself. He said, I won't leave you comfortless. He said, I will come to you. Amen, when you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got Jesus living in you. And when you've got Jesus living in you, you've got healing living in you. You've got hope living in you. You've got strength living. He said it's to be a comforter to you. When you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got everything you need. Somebody shout amen. That's why he told the woman at the well, he said, it will be a well in you springing up. And that's what they were talking about, to, uh, singing about this morning, that it will be a well springing up into everlasting life. So when you need hope, it's already in you. When you need strength, it's already in you. When you need God, he's already there. You just got to stir it. Oh, I think we ought to clap our hands and celebrate and thank God for his spirit. So... Welcome to Pentecost Sunday. Welcome to Pentecost Sunday. I think you ought to turn to two or three people before you're seated and say, Welcome to Pentecost Sunday. Amen. And if you want the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and you don't have it, it's a gift for everybody. For the rich, for the poor, for the black, for the white. Come on, for the down and out, for the up and out, for everybody. The Holy Ghost is for everybody. You can have it today. God bless you. You may be seated. I have a few brief, quick announcements. And uh, I'm going to go real fast. You grab your Bibles with me. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of the Lord. Welcome to Pentecost. Welcome to Pentecost. Amen. Brother, Sister Mel and your family, so good to see you all today. Appreciate all of you and uh, thankful for what I feel in this room already. Tonight's going to be so powerful. I want you to go. I expect you to go and uh, because there's something about when churches get together, something really happens. There's going to be 10 or 12 churches gathering together and uh, my brother has preached crusades and uh, he is going to be preaching tonight. There's going to be many people healed. Many people feel it as well with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be awesome. This is something you want your kids to see. Um, I've seen many miracles. My brother has seen many miracles. I grew up in, the, in Pentecost where we believe that God can do absolutely anything. Can you say amen? The book of Acts chapter 4, uh, Acts 4. I got some news I'm going to talk to you about today that's very important uh, for this church, the future of this church. And it's very intentional. I want you to stick around and, uh, and hear what I'm going to be saying toward the end of the message. But uh, the Bible says in Acts 4, 28, um, 4 verse 28, it says, um, or verse 29, excuse me. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, everybody say boldness, they may speak thy 
word. The reason he said this is because there had been a great revival that happened starting on the day of Pentecost. Um, that holiday, the, what was known as the Feast of Weeks, 40 na- 49 days of harvest celebrated on the 50th day where you get Penta, Pentecost. It's the Feast of Weeks. It's, it became known as the day of Pentecost, celebrating the harvest. It's interesting here that God chose to pour His Spirit out on that day. Amen. A great revival broke out. Started with 120, went to 3,000, and it spread. There were miracles that happened. An impotent man was healed, and when he was healed, it called many unbelievers to believe in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the Bible said 5,000 believers. Everybody say 5,000. Oh, the religious rulers got so upset about it. They, they, they brought Simon and Peter, the disciples, in, and, and they were trying to figure out how they was going to convict them and stop them. And finally, they realized they couldn't hurt them or imprison them because there were so many believers And they said, you cannot speak in this name any longer. And so out of that came this prayer, that prayer, because they had been forbidden by the government to preach the name of Jesus. And that's why they said in verse 29 in their prayer, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they, speaking to themselves and the believers, may speak thy word, that they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, they ask God to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. They believe there was power in the name of Jesus. There's not much power in the name Aaron. There's not power in the name Bounds or your name. But when you say Jesus, there's something powerful that happens in the name of Jesus. Oh, amen. Somebody say amen. amen. David said, you come to me with the sword, a spear, and a shield, but I come against you in the name. In the name of the Lord of hosts. You know what he was saying? I'm not by myself. I have somebody with me that's bigger than your cancer, that's bigger than your problem, that's bigger than your situation. How many believe the name of the Lord is powerful? Somebody shout amen. amen. And he prayed that in the name. And verse 31 was the answer to the prayer. And when they had prayed, everybody say, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. Everybody say with boldness. Somebody that hadn't talked to in months in mid-text today instead of praying for you, they said, preach the word with boldness. They didn't know my text was this. God knows, God knows. Everybody say with boldness. The scripture says, and when they had prayed. And I'm going to preach to you, not changing scriptural words, but from the context, what I'm going to preach is simply, but when you pray. But when you pray. Something happens when you pray. Do you believe something happens when you pray? Oh, clap your hands and magnify them. One more time before you're seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God bless you as you are seated. But when, but when ye pray. When you begin to look at what happened with the believers, Jesus had told his disciples, there was about 500 of them that went with him to the Mount of Olives when he ascended, when he ascended on that 40th day after his resurrection. When he was in the Mount of Olives, he looked at those believers, about 500 of them, and he said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait until you be endued with power from on high. How many know he said that? Look at your neighbor and say, wait. The problem was we have a hard time waiting. That's why out of 500, only 120 waited. Because we get impatient, don't we? Sometimes when we pray or God speaks to us a word, we get impatient. We want it right now. You want a Taco Bell, Wendy's? drive through, order it here, better have it here. We think when we pray, it better happen tomorrow. But he said, I want you to wait. Trust me when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do that. I mean, no, he's not slack concerning his promises. The Bible tells us. As some men count slackness, but he longs suffering. Amen. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So there was the waiting on him, and those that waited were not disappointed. Because on that 50th day, which was known as Pentecost, everybody say Pentecost. Pentecost was the the celebration of the law being given at Mount Sinai. 
50 days after the Passover as well. That's where the law was given. Up on a mountain that the word of God came to Moses. When after 120 trumpeters that blew the trumpet, 3,000 that touched the mountain died. How I many know in Mount Sinai that happened? And the law was given. And they would celebrate that by taking two leaven loaves of bread. And they would take it up like this. Put, take your loaves of bread and put them up in the air. And they would wave offering it before the Lord. See, the wave started in the scripture. Amen. The wave offering. One more time, wave that. You know what that was? It was a sign that God had given them the law. He had given them the word of God. He had written it down and they would wave that bread to the Lord. Talking about the word of God was the bread. Can you say amen? But praise God, on the day of Pentecost, celebrating that, there were 120 in the upper room. There were 3,000 added to the church that day. And guess what? The law was not, the word, the law was not written on stone. It was written on the heart of man when they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak with other tongues as God gave them the ability to speak. The law had been written in the heart. I'm so glad God touched me one day, put his finger, his heart into my heart. Amen. His hand in my heart and touched me. Would you? clap your hands and thank God that he touched you one day the Bible te teaches us that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost that when the Holy Ghost moves upon you speaking is what happens that's why the Word of God was written God moved up on them and they wrote the Word of the Lord amen holy men in the New Testament we find that principle still remains because Jesus taught us, he said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What goes in the heart will come out of your mouth. Where you focus your attention, what your desires are, that is what you're going to talk about. That's why when his spirit comes into your heart, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost that when he filled them with the Holy Ghost, they begin to speak in another language. They did. What were they saying? The Bible said they began to speak the wonderful works of God. I don't care if you speak hillbilly. I don't care if you speak ghetto. I don't care if you speak proper. It doesn't matter. When you, you know, I haven't been accused ever of speaking good English, but guess what? Whether you speak English or Espanol, it doesn't matter. Uh, when you get the Holy Ghost, you're going to speak in an unknown tongue. Unknown to you. Unfamiliar to you. Paul's teaching was this. He said, when you begin to pray in the spirit, he said, matter of fact, he said, I speak in tongues more than you all. He said, but when you begin to pray in the spirit, he said, your understanding is unfruitful. But the spirit knows what you pray for, for in tongues you speak mysteries. Praise God. I'm just gonna word it this way. When God fills you with his spirit, he gives you a direct line to his throne, amen. And you begin to speak life into yourself, life into your world. It's known as Pentecost. So when somebody says they're Pentecostal, what they're saying, they have received and or believe that you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in a heavenly language. How many know it's in the Bible? And I think we ought to clap our hands and thank God for this truth. Praise the name of the Lord. But when Pentecost came, there's more to Pentecost than speaking in other tongues. Jesus or John the Baptist declared that when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire spreads. When Pentecost happened, he knew what was going to happen. It wasn't going to stay in Jerusalem. It was going to go from Jerusalem to all Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost part of the earth. That's what happened in Acts 4, is that when the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, it wasn't just 120, it spread to 3,000. It didn't just stop at 3,000, it went to 5,000. Somebody say 5,000. That people were so stirred. They were so moved by this experience. They started telling others about it. Amen. That's why on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell, people started speaking in tongues. People were worshiping and shouting and moving in such a manner that people thought there was something different about them. Matter of fact, they were accused them of being drunk. They said, and he had to respond and said, these are not drunk as ye suppose. They're not, they didn't get a hold of Grandpa Cider. They're, they're, not, they're not drinking wine. This is different. And they begin to say, well, what is this? What meaneth this? It's sort of like when the children of Israel come out of Egypt and went into the wilderness and, and bread fell from heaven. They looked on the ground. They'd never seen anything like it. 
And Moses had told him, God said he's going to send bread. Bread's going to come from heaven. It's going to be angels' food. And they looked around. They woke up one morning. There was bread, wafers, wafers that tasted like honey. It's all over the ground when the dew lifted. And everybody began to say, what is this? What is this? That's what manna means. What is this? Look at your neighbor and say, what is this? You know what Moses said? It's bread. I told you God's sending bread. Everybody say manna. It's bread. And on the day of Pentecost, they heard people speaking in other tongues. They thought they were drunk. These people were joyous. They're speaking the wonderful works of God in different, language, different languages. And they begin to say, what is this? What meaneth this? Oh, Simon Peter stood up just like the Lord told him that he would. He stood up. He said, brethren, he said, this is what Joel said was going to happen. In the last days, saith God, I am going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to see visions. Could I tell you, Pentecost was the outpouring of the spirit of God. Are you thankful for it? Clap your hands and shout amen. I'm so glad I received it one day. I'm so glad. I was, it was February the 20, 22nd, 1987. I was eight years old. It was a Sunday, Sunday evening children's revival. There was an evangelist with a, with a rabbit, rabbit puppet, and he had preached to the kids with Righty Rabbit. And he had talked uh, every night of revival. He'd talk about that and had that, had that Righty Rabbit. Boy, I was just consumed. But before the revival, I wanted to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I wanted it very, very badly. Matter of fact, I went home one Christmas because uh, we lived in North Carolina at the time. And I went home and, and my grandmother on Christmas, my Mimi, I miss her very much. Mimi said to me, she said, Aaron, would you like a cup of coffee? I was eight years old. She's offering me a cup of coffee. There might be a problem with that. I don't know. Uh, I still love coffee today. And I said, oh, Mimi, I said, I can't have. I said, I'll take a cup of coffee. I said, she said, would you like two scoops of sugar? And guess what? I still get two scoops of sugar in my coffee. And, uh, um, and she said, would you like two scoops of sugar? And I said, Mimi, I don't want any sugar. She said, well, why not? I said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to get sugar diabetes and die before I get the Holy Ghost. I just assumed if you have sugar diabetes, it must come from sugar. And uh, I certainly didn't understand it. Then in my childhood, like faith, I wanted to get the Holy Ghost on Christmas, on his birthday. I wanted him to fill me with that. Didn't happen on Christmas like I thought, but I'll never forget when that evangelist, children's evangelist with the righty rabbit preaching, Started talking about receiving the Holy Ghost and God's Spirit coming upon your life. How many know that's what's missing in people's lives? That's what's missing in your life. You're not going to find joy in alcohol. You're not going to find joy. It might be momentary, but you're going to still feel empty. You're not going to find it in an extra relationship. You're, you're, you're not going to find it in a promotion. You're not going to find it in, in something like that. Let me tell you where you're going to get joy. You're going to get it when you, God fills you with His Spirit. There's only one thing that can fill you. It's His Spirit. Some things can make you feel better, but not fill you. Can you say amen? The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There's a verse in Colossians 2, 9, and it says it this way. It says, in him, speaking of Christ, dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. If you feel incomplete here today, I know the solution. If you have holes in your life, I know the solution. How many know the Holy Ghost will make you feel complete and full? My cup runneth over. Oh, clap your hands and say, my cup runneth over. Amen. That's what happened. These people that received this gift caught on fire. They took the gospel everywhere they went, house to house. 3,000 returned to their nations uh, and uh, different nations and in Jerusalem and it spread from house to house, the conversation at home. It turned to prayer meetings and evangelism and when people would see, see when you get the Holy Ghost, it'll give you fire. Somebody shout fire. Oh, it'll give you fire. It'll make you want to pray, make you want to read your Bible, make you want to go to church. How many know it's true? And it'll make you want to tell your neighbor about it. Simon Peter preached it this way. When they got up first before the Holy Ghost fell on the 3,000, people were saying, what is this? He preached the cross to them. He talked about Jesus dying. He preached the gospel. And when he preached the gospel, they began to say something like this. What shall we do? We want this. That's what they were saying. We want this. What is this? And he began to talk to them about Joel's prophecy. Preach the cross and what the cross has brought to us. They said, what shall we do? And then he said in verse chapter 2 and uh, verse 38, let's look and see what it says. 
Amen. Acts 2 and 38. Then Peter said unto them, he said to everybody that was in that multitude that had gathered those thousands that were there, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, amen. And in next verse, he said, for this promise is unto you and. Don't forget the principle of Pentecost. Pentecost is that the Holy Ghost, this promise, this salvation, is not just for you, it's for you and. Somebody say, and. It's enough to get in you, to flow out of you, into somebody else. So it's for you and your children and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Somebody say, and. Watch the next verse. The next verse, uh, not the next verse, but watch this, this verse I'm gonna bring you. Acts 1 and 8, and I'm teaching you this morning. Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to, them to me. Where? In Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Everybody say, it doesn't stop with Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. Can I tell you today, we are a Pentecostal church. What that means, God's not just gonna bless you, he's gonna bless you and. He's gonna give it to you and. He's not gonna just give it to us, he's gonna give it to us and. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. He's not just going to give it to me. He's going to give it to me and somebody else. And so when God began to move in this church, many years ago, and this we're celebrating our 80th year. It's hard to believe, 80 years this church is celebrating. But several years ago, uh, probably 14 plus years ago, God began to deal with me about some things. We started changing the way we did a few things. And some years ago, God dealt with me about a uh, regional revival. I didn't know how it was going to happen. Everybody say regional revival. When I was growing up, there was this concept inside of me that, that growing up, just in my mind, not that I was taught this way, but just sort of how I thought, is that a preacher gets voted into a church inside of a building. People vote him in, and he begins to pastor what's ever in the building. Then I heard Wayne Huntley preach a message one time, Reverend Wayne Huntley, and he said, God didn't call a man to pastor people in a building, he calls a pastor to pastor a city. Somebody say a city. Then I heard somebody else preach that God can call someone to pastor a region. That's apostleship. That's where you begin to train up and send out. I begin to understand this. And I, how, many, how many were here when I got up and prophesied as a young, you know, probably thought I was a little bit young, maybe zealous without knowledge, very possible. I was 29 years old when I became the pastor of this church. And I got up and I said, praise God, we're going to see a 60,000 soul revival. Oh, you clapped your hand and shouted hallelujah. But hey, you can't get 60,000 people in here. How many know that? You can't have a 60,000 soul revival in this building. You can't have a 60,000 soul revival out of this building. It's not big enough to hold 60,000, but it's big enough to reach 60,000. How many want to be a part of that? If you want to be a part of that, I want you to shout amen. Come on, if you want to be a part of that, shout amen because God is going to do it. I said he is going to do it. Praise God. And I'll never forget Matthew Tuttle, young evangelist that came, user of the Lord. He stopped, didn't know what I'd prophesied. And he turned around, he said, why settle for 60,000 when you can have 600,000 people? Praise the name of the Lord. I believe that still today because Pentecost didn't die with 12 apostles. It, it came into them, through them, and it spread like a wildfire. Something powerful happened. Can you say amen? A little history, just a quick moment of history. When you look, when Pentecost hit again in the United States in the early 1900s from a 42-member college group in Topeka, Kansas, they began to study about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the, uh, William Parham, the professor, he said, I want you to go home. He said, and I want you to study what happens to people when they receive the Holy Ghost. All 42 students, when they got back, you know what they said? They said, when somebody receives this baptism of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, 
it appears they begin to speak with other tongues. And he said, if it can happen in the Bible, these 42 students said, if it can happen in the Bible, then it can. And you know what they did? They started praying. And guess what? All 42 of them received the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, before the professor did. But he got it too. It caught on fire. They started talking about, you can speak with other tongues. Amen. I know it's been mocked at and scoffed at. They wrote articles in, in California when it began to be poured out. They made fun of them. They called them babbling tongue talkers, but they couldn't keep the fire down. That fire has spread. It's too late now. It has engulfed nations now. Somebody shout, it's a fire. Because when he gives you the Holy Ghost, it's not just a moment. There's a fire that settles on you that starts burning out the chaff. It starts burning out the sin. It's, it'll cause you, it'll call a quiet man, cause a quiet man to be a bold man because there's power in the Holy Ghost. It'll cause shy people to believe for the power of God in other people's lives. Oh, I'm stirred in this today. And it spread down to Texas. I said it this morning, Brother Nehemiah. It was spread down to Texas. But in a year, Brother Timothy, you wouldn't have been allowed in that Bible school back then because your skin's a little bit dark. And back then, during segregation, they had a Bible college, and they wouldn't let. But there's a man by the name of William Seymour. He didn't let segregation keep him from what those people had. He leaned his ear. This is history. He leaned his ear to the door of that Bible college class where William Parham was preaching about the Holy Ghost and fire. And when he did, he believed he could get it. He got so stirred, the revelation of it, he took a church pastorate in California. And when he did, he would jump up with fervor and fire and he would jump up with excitement and he'd jump up and down and preach. You can have the Holy Ghost. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost. He hadn't even received it yet. He had never even spoken in other tongues himself. But he preached it and believed it. He'd come back to the next service and that, those, that church board had locked him out of the church they had elected him as pastor. They put a padlock on it, but it was too late. Gospel hadn't gotten out. He's standing outside. He had church outside, and it caused a mighty revival. It wasn't long until they bought a little livery stable down in Los Angeles, California. It was an old AME building, African Methodist Episcopal building, building, and they bought that building, and they started praying. They started having services three times a day for three years. It was a fire that just went across the United States of America. Oh, it was so powerful. It became a Multicultural revival. Can I tell you, there's no segregation in the church. There's no segregation in the Holy Ghost. There's no segregation in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It broke, it broke racial barriers. It broke denominational barriers. It did something powerful. Come on, what man has separated God can put back together. That's what Pentecost is about. The fire was so hot. Brother Gators, come here. I'm gonna have you to run for a minute. You, you represent that Holy Ghost and fire. That soul winning preacher worshiping in you. The guy that wants to take the gospel to everybody lost. Oh yeah, it, it got in him. And that revival spread across the United States of America. It went out of a city. It went to another state. It, it, went, it went from a, a livery stable to a city, to a state, to another state, to where it engulfed all the way across the United States of America. It was such a hot revival. It jumped the Atlantic Ocean. It landed down in Wales, England. Are you with me right now? And 100,000 people were filled that, with the Holy Ghost in Wales, England. And it hasn't stopped. It is right now consuming South America right now. There are people, amen, he is pouring his spirit out. And it's here. It's right here right now. Come on, I'm preaching here today. And anywhere the revival goes, there's gonna be people healed. Blinded eyes will be open. Deaf ears will be unstopped. Lame men will leap. Amen, dumb men will talk because when he comes, he always brings healing with him. Can you say amen? I meet people in every denomination that they tell me, even in denom denominations that have not accepted this. I have private conversations with them. And when they start talking to me, they say, well, I was praying. I felt something come over me. I was taught it couldn't happen. But oh, but when I begin to pray, I begin to speak in a language I could not understand. I said, here it is in the book of Acts. It is for you and, but it's not just for you. Come on, somebody. It's not just for Zanesville. 
it's not just for me. I was eight years old, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I lifted my little hands in the air and I said, I love you, Jesus. I felt something come over me I had never felt before in my life. It flowed into me like a river when it got down in my heart. Oh, I, I began to shuffle my feet. I was just a kid. It was like plugging into a, to a 440 outlet. It was so wonderful, the power of God. He filled me with his Holy Ghost. I began to weep and I began to cry. I began to speak in other tongues as he gave me the ability to speak. When I got home that night, I had stammering lips. Oh, I feel this today. I went home. It might seem silly to you, but don't knock it till you try it. It's the power of God. Amen. It made me want to live right. It made me want to walk right. I fell in love with his word. Brother Tay, from that moment forward, I had a desire to read my Bible every night. I had a desire to go to the house of God when the doors were open. Something got in me and changed me. You know what it was? It was his spirit. It was his spirit. Come on, I'm preaching to you today. Because when you get the Holy Ghost, you won't need, you don't need that dope anymore. When you get the Holy Ghost, you won't have that brokenness anymore. He'll heal every broken part of your heart, every broken part of your spirit. There is power in the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout, there's power in the Holy Ghost. My goodness. So when Pentecost happens, it changes you. And. Somebody say, it changes me. And. Watch this. And so it broke out here. We had a great revival that began to break out. I don't have time. I'm trying to get to a point here today. But there was prophecy over me. One, one man looked at me. He came here and told the church and preached about four dimensions harvest. It's going to be online this week. I want, they're going to have it ready for you to watch. And uh, Brother Mark Morgan, he's a prophet. He turned around to me after he preached and the Spirit of God moved mightily in that service. It was life changing. He turned to me and he said, Brother Bounds? I said, yes, sir. He said, are you ready to pastor cities? I don't know what that, didn't really know what that meant, but I said, by the grace of God. He said, get ready, get ready to pastor cities. You know what I learned? That the Holy Ghost isn't better than Zanesville. It's just bigger than Zanesville. Come on, it's not better than a church. It's just bigger than the church. Can you say amen? It's bigger than this. Somebody shout, it's bigger than this. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't get 60,000 people in this building. But this building can reach 60,000 people. Do you believe that? Come on, turn to somebody and say, the building's too small. But it's big enough to do what God wants us to do. Oh, when Pentecost happens, it'll cause quiet men to want to be preachers. It'll cause timid ladies to want to be intercessors. It'll change you. You'll become so bubbly, people will want to be around you. What is that that's happening? I've never seen you this happy. It's that Holy Ghost down in my soul, just like the Bible says. I know you're thinking about Cracker Barrel, but I'm thinking about revival right now. God wants to do something. God wants to do something mighty. Somebody shout mighty. Look at your neighbor and say amen. He's better. He's better. Regional revival. He said, he said, there's going to be a re, he said, get ready to pastor cities. And that's what we did. Oh, we launched a church in Crooksville. Oh, we went there. We didn't have money. We had faith. God sent the money because we had faith. Bought a building and went. Had a team that went, went there and began to minister. We went from Crooksville. It wasn't long until we were in Cambridge and great revival broke out in Cambridge. Praise God. I remember one time in one week we baptized 23 people. One week alone. People were coming off the streets. We went to McConnellsville. We sure did. It wasn't long we went to Coshocton. Are y'all with me right now? We went to Gloucester. We went on to New Lexington. Recently, the most recent, we went to Woodsfield. Seven campuses right there. Where in all of them, there's been some Sundays that we baptize in every campus because it's bigger than the building. Yes. Sister Candy, jump up. You're here because we went there. We went to Crooksville believing, and guess what? You got it just like the Bible says. Amen. She just represents one of many. Somebody say, shout hallelujah. 
Oh, we didn't stop there. Had a prophet came and said, the Lord had told you there's a double. He said, but God's going to give you triple. Because of that prophecy, we went to Guatemala. They're doing the same thing there because we didn't just go to pay 10. We went to pay 10 and 15 cities. Thousands represented there. Oh, we didn't stop in Guatemala. <laughs> Amen. We took some missionaries out of the church and we sent them to Vietnam where there have been thousands impacted in a communist country because this is bigger than this church. It's bigger than my ministry. It's bigger than your family. It's bigger. Somebody shout revival. Amen. Brother Nehemiah, I forgot about you over there. I forgot about you. I'm stirred this morning. Because God's not done. You had, you had seven daughter works here. Add it to 15 in Guatemala. You know what that is? That's 22. Somebody prophesied we were going to have 50 campuses in southeastern Ohio. I believe it. I receive it. Come on. I said I believe it and I receive it. I promise you, I commit to you, we will not stop training, we will not stop sending, we will not stop praying, and we will not stop converting. That's who we are. We are preachers of the gospel. We are the body of Christ, and that's what he's called us to do. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. I wish somebody right now jumped to your feet and say, it's gonna happen, pastor. Come on, I wish somebody jumped. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. 60,000 is too small. It's gonna happen. See, moments happen. Moments happen. Praise God. I was preaching right here one time. I fell on my knees, began to intercede over Germany, a place I've never been, be began to pray strongly for the country of Germany. Some of you were here that day, many years ago. I began to intercede over Germany. And when I did, oh, I, I felt like, I told the church, I said, we need to pray for Germany. I believe there's going to be a great work in Germany. And uh, had a man that didn't know this prayer. Years later, came up to me. He came up to me about year or so ago. He said, the Lord would have me to tell you that he's going to put a man in your life that's from the German-speaking country. He said, I've already seen him. He has a scar over his right eye. He said, he's going to bring him in your life and he's going to be the key to the German-speaking country. I believe that's going to happen. Because it starts and. God's not just going to bless you. He's going to bless you and. There's missionaries in this room. There are pastors in this room. There are people that you don't even know it yet, but he's about to birth something so powerful. The fire is going to burn out the fear and he's going to baptize you with faith and you're going to do great exploits for him. Somebody say amen. amen. That was their prayer. There's great threatenings. How many of you have felt threatened? Like this is trying to take you out. They're trying to preach the gospel and it looks like everything's against them. They have been told, don't you dare make mention of his name anymore. Oh, you know what they did? They let him go and they told him, don't make mention. Oh, uh, when you threaten a believer, they start praying. And when they start praying, something mighty starts happening. Look at your neighbor and say, just go ahead and pray. God's going to fix it. See, prayer is not easy. Prayer is not convenient. I said, it's not easy and it's not convenient. Prayer comes from sacrifice. To pray, you've got to not do something you want to do, like sleep. Get up and pray. Everybody say pray. To pray, you're saying no to something and yes to God. I've learned that some of your greatest yeses come from your greatest no's. Everybody say no. No to what I want. And I'm going to say yes to prayer. Because prayer is what changes everything. No altar, no Pentecost. You can go to church seven days a week and be lost because you don't have an altar. It's not about going to church. It's about being right with God. More church does not mean more spiritual. You can have more activities and be less spiritual because you don't pray. Prayer is the key. One of the most critical moments in my life was when I was 19 years old. My dad and I, I helped my dad pastor three churches. We were in many meetings, many, many things, and I almost lost my way with God. And the reason I did, because I had learned to preach without praying. You can be a Sunday school teacher that's backsliding. You can be a choir member that's backsliding. You can be a faithful attendee at the church while backsliding because you're not praying. 
I say to this congregation, in your car you drive, when you're leaving, there's gauges that tell you when you need to fuel up, when you need to change your oil, if the battery's getting low. You're going to see that in the car because there's gauges that let you know the condition of the car. Here's the gauge of your Christianity. If you're not praying, your gauge says you're about to die. No prayer, no spiritual life. You've got to have prayer to have power. How often should we pray? The Bible says pray without ceasing. When you pray, when you pray. See, it's inconvenient to get up and pray, but look at the title here today. But when you pray, he brings health. But when you pray, he brings strength. But when you pray, he does what you can't do in seven days of work. He will do more in a little time than you can do in a lifetime because when you pray, it brings God into your world. Somebody say, it brings God into my world. Some of you are fretting because you don't have the ability to do what you need to do. Some of you have right now, under the sound of my voice in this room, that you're fretting because it seems like it's out of your hands. That's a perfect time to call on the Lord and pray because when it's out of your hands, you can put it in His hands and He'll fix it. Come on, is that you right now? Is that you right now? I say, but when you pray, it's not convenient, it's not easy, but when you pray, something's gonna happen. Something's gonna take place and fix it. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so in this, I come to understand that we can have a lot of church while not praying. How many know it's true? I... um, I recently began to look at our processes because when COVID hit, when COVID hit, it caused us not to get less busy, but more busy. We went from Sunday morning and Sunday night to four Sunday morning services. We had a Saturday night, Sunday morning, a Sunday morning, a Sunday morning, and a Sunday night prayer. I know if I called Sunday night service, that'd be more crowded because of social distancing is why we did that because we tried to stay safe through the the whole pandemic. How many remember all that? Some of you forgot about it. Even when we got through that, we wanted to grow through that. So we remained at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and we kept 6 p.m. And uh, I don't care who you are, that's tiring. You try to preach four times on a weekend and come and hang out with me. Amen. It's not easy. A lot of preaching. That's a lot of preparing. That's a lot of spending. Not only did we add more church, not only did we add more church to the team, Not only are we sending 50 plus people out of this building on Sundays to minister in other cities, and then they come back to Sunday night. Not only are we doing that, but on top of all of that, we've added a school. And it's not easy. I'm a math teacher. Did you know that? I'm smarter than you think I am, praise God. I'm not a math teacher often, but sometimes I am. We jumped in to try to help these kids and this need of them wanting to be in this environment. And so we added a school that now has 70 plus students in that, on top of that. As your pastor, are y'all with me right now? We have added to, but we haven't ever taken anything away. I understand that. I'm just, I'm not only your preacher, I'm also a shepherd. What the Bible calls me, I'm a shepherd. And it's my duty to watch the sheep. And I've seen the sheep spend and be spent believe in this vision and continue to believe it's going to happen as uh, some have probably already left today going to another campus some are about to leave when i get done and i'm taking a little bit of time here and uh, but i feel this is necessary for you to hear this never take anything away but there is a verse in the scripture in psalms 23 the bible says it this way when he said the lord is my shepherd i shall not want the shepherd wants me to be a prosperous and have provision how many know that's true But he goes on and says, he maketh me to lie down. And I understand in this church, in 13 years of multi-campus, we have, listen, you're a healthy mama. You produced a lot of babies, and I've showed that up here today. Ministries that go out. You are a mother church, not just a church. Do you know that these campuses are still dependent on you? It's like an umbilical cord going out to some of them. You're feeding them financially and resources of of giftings and talents from this church. How many know that? That right now we are providing finances to build, finances uh, uh, to go. We're also getting the gospel out there. It's not cheap. It never comes free. How many know that? But with that, these people that are going are returning to a Sunday night and uh, they're probably battery level is about 20%. 
What am I saying? I'm saying that we want to continue to reach this region, but we can't do it the way we're doing it. We have to take something away. I come to you as your pastor today to present to you that we cannot lose our altar over more church and busy ministries. We must have a personal altar in our life. And so I submit to you through much counsel, counsel with my elders, my dad who is my pastor, counsel with Bishop White, my peers and people that have great churches that are above where we are, where we want to be, that I've talked to. And I had one man to come in. He said, I didn't come because you asked me. I come because I prayed. He said, the Lord has shown me some things. And uh, he said, you've added. He said, but it's time to let the... He, he began to give me talk about processes. And I felt in my spirit, it's time for this shepherd to let you rest. How am I going to do that? Pastor, how are we going to do that? How are you going to make us lay down? Here's how we're going to do it. Is that Sunday nights that have been in the existence of this church. We're going to go from four, every Sunday night church to we're going to go to one Sunday night a month. Some of you are probably shouting hallelujah right now. Some of you are maybe disappointed. But one Sunday night a month. Why? Because we are not just a church. We are a mother church that is ministering to a region. If this church died today and shriveled up, there's, there's people that would suffer for that. Spiritually, um, emotionally, and churches would suffer. That They would. I'm saying if everybody in this room, because they're dependent, the same way as a mother, if you died right now, your kids would suffer over that. How I many know that's true? They need you. We are needed. I don't say it arrogantly. It's what God has called us to because we are a... a Zanesville and we are Pentecostal, which means there's an and. So what we're going to do is the first Sunday of every month, we're going to ask everybody that we're sending to come back on Sunday nights, Sunday nights with their team so they can minister, be ministered to, and we can connect together because we're better together. Oh, let the church say amen. Y'all making me nervous now. Hey, they're going to come in. From all over the region, the people that we send, every, the first Sunday night of the month, and we will do that consistently. There will be some Sunday nights, though, that are going to be crusades, and that's, that's, that's everybody in those churches are going to come to be healed and miracle service, and God's going to move. And how many know there are going to be signs, wonders, and miracles that take place in that service? Would you clap your hands? How many is going to support this and help me in this? Would you say Amen. There's, there are these questions. There are these questions that come. What about the verse that says, assemble yourself together and do more so as the hour approaches? We're, we haven't assembled less. I mean, for 10 years, I was in five church services a week. Three on Sunday and two midweeks. Preach those, most of those. Brother Nehemiah, you, you relate with this. Our pastor relate. We've done a lot of church and a lot of people in this church have done a lot of that. What I'm saying to you is the future of this church is not we're going to stop having church here but there's going to be home groups all over the city, all over the region, where people are preaching the gospel with boldness. Why is it when we think assembly, we have to be on a platform with a band and a choir? It's not what it means. It wasn't the way it was. They went from house to house. And what God's going to do, he's going to let a light come on in your home. And it's going to be a light to your neighborhood. That's what's going to happen. There are so many ministers in here. God's gonna use you like he did Emily today when she was praying. There's a light gonna come to your house. This morning I called Pastor Richard and he knows the decision that I'm making. And uh, I called him because I know he preached a message a while back and I felt nudged of the Lord. I've got up, I got up very, very early this morning. And uh, I, I looked at the verse Remember the verse is something he preached. The Bible says in Exodus 10, I want you to all write this down and pray this prayer. Exodus 10, Exodus 10 and verse 22. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Darkness came upon 
all the land of Egypt. But it was those Hebrew children. In their homes, there were light. Can I tell you, the Bible talks about the darkness of the end time. But I preach to the children of God right now under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. There's going to be light in your home. There's going to be revelation in your house. There's going to be light in your ministry. There's going to be light in the hour of darkness. Let's all stand to our feet and clap our hands and say there's going to be light. You are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that can't be hid. Somebody say God's bringing light to my family. I really want every mouth open. I want you to say that God is going to bring light to my family. And Pastor Gators and Pastor Mark Mealy approached me earlier this year and said, there's something what we feel you, we leave it up to you, you're the pastor. But it was in relation to what we're talking about tonight. Trust me, Brother Schultz, I am a traditionalist. I buy my gas at the same gas station, the same pump. I go to the same restaurant, sit at the same table, hope for the same waiter, and order the same meal. That's who I am. I don't want to remove Sunday nights. But I feel like if I do not do this, I would be disobeying the Holy Ghost. And I've got to follow the Holy Ghost. Not about me. Not about my tradition. It's about what does the Lord want. I'm going to tell you what He's going to do. You're going to find a health for your mind, your spirit. What do Sunday nights look like when we are not at church? Once a month, there might be an occasional moment that there's some inspiration that we feel to do. We're not gonna remove that if God says to do something. But on a consistent basis, the first Sunday of the month will be Sunday night church. And my expectation is we all come here because it's bigger than us. Can you say man? be faithful to that? But what I'm saying, those three nights, don't go to church somewhere that night because you're so spiritual. And you, you're just traditional. I've got to be in church Sunday night. Listen, you need to go home and rest. My life has not been the same since I taught you about the Sabbath on a Wednesday night. I'm so convicted. I'm so convicted. Because we can get so busy that we're not even thankful for what God is doing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. We need to be able to say, I thank you for what you did for me. Now I thank you for what you're going to do for me. But we only have time to do that because we're so busy. Sunday night should be a place of fellowship with your friends and family members, but not some scheduled event that you lock this in. Are you with me right now? You've got to rest. What are you doing? I'm making you lie down. That's what I'm doing. Because that's what I feel as a shepherd. And I believe God's going to bring greatness to this. Can you say amen? amen. Would you clap your hands and thank God? <laughs> Come to music. Why are you doing this? Because I feel led of the Lord. God ever wants to change this in the future, that's up to him. But I'm going to follow him. Something I do feel the Lord has given me permission to do, and uh, just remain standing. I'm I'm closing. And uh, I think you're processing. That's maybe why you're so quiet. Are y'all with me? Look at your neighbor and say, you need rest. You're tired. Yeah. Can't tell you how many times I've had somebody tell me, slow down, pace yourself. That's what my teaching was on that Wednesday night. Everybody say, slow down and let God do it. What I'm going to do is I've made a decision also is, uh, also is that we've been 9 and 11 for a couple years. And we're going to change that as well. It's better together. And uh, I had somebody told me, they said, separating that, uh, at least for a period of time, it's like separating the hand from the foot. The hand says to the foot. The body speaks to each other. I'm not the body. I'm just part of the body. You're the body. Sister Candy, at moments we felt disconnected after COVID. It pushed us. There's people in here. They rotate services so they can see the church. Because you go months without seeing people. You wonder how they're doing. Because the Bible says we're to pray with all prayer and all, all prayer and supplication for all the saints. We're to be praying for one. We're to be praying for one another. How I many know it's true? I pray for you. I do. Call your name out. Walk your seats this morning where you're sitting. Pray. Call your names out. Asking God to help you minister to you. I believe in the power of prayer. You can have a lot of church without fire, without passion. If I'm at 70% and I give God my all, have I given God my all? What if I could do less and do 100%? Would I be giving God my all? 
you're afraid to answer because your neighbor's sitting close to you. Uh, but if I can give God my all at 100% instead of giving God my all at 20%, isn't it a better sacrifice? Because God does not speak to a weary mind or a busy mind. He expects you to be balanced. Why are you doing this, Pastor? Are you backsliding? No, if you thought that, you're backslidden. You know where you're going. Amen. I'm not backslid. I'm not doing less church. We're just going to do it better. Our intentions are to train. Sunday mornings, our services will start at 10. It's going to be 10 with the Word. Our children will be in Sunday school, and we'll be in, we'll be in Bible study here from 10 to about 1040, maybe 1045. Class will be dismissed. You can get your kids. You can take a restroom break. You can go to the cafe. You can see somebody. If you get your kids and come in here, we're going to have a family worship service on Sunday mornings like we were, and we'll have once a month on Sunday nights. You'll see all kinds of events that's going to take place. This, this pulpit will be multicultural, as it already is, multi-generational, as we see on Sunday nights. Our kids will be worshiping with us, with your family, at 11 o'clock. Can you say amen? God's going to do, it's going to be our evangelistic service that people get healed, they get filled, they get restored, people come back in, we want everybody to come. It starts at 10. You say, I'm going to be here a little bit, but you're going to have your evenings. Can the church say amen? Are y'all going to be with me? Yes. Clap your hands and thank God for it. I want everybody to gather around the front with me. You'll see in that worship service, two or three songs go right in the preaching. With, with, with evangelistic sermon that is not as long as they are now with the power of God moving I'm asking you to support me I realize it breaks tradition I realize it's uncomfortable and I realize it could be um, disappointing to some and maybe refreshing to others but if you'll if you'll follow and you allow you're going to find health to your life everybody say health I want to live a long time and uh, I want our team to succeed. I, I don't want to, neither do I want people under me to lead on empty. Do you hear me? There's a book called lead, Leading on Empty. You need to read it. There's another one called Addicted to Busy. And um, uh, if my pastor would said, no, it's the wrong direction, I wouldn't do it. At the end of the day, I didn't want to do it. But I feel this is right. I have... I have, my wife will tell you, I've been in, in, in internal conflict between doing what I feel is right and doing what I've traditionally done. But what's going to happen out of this is you're going to see small groups flourish. You're going to see ministries flourish. That's going to be an opportunity to get deep in the Word and amen, have family worship. There's nothing like worshiping God with your family. That's the reason we created the structure on Sunday morning. And we've been working on this I've been working on this for quite some time with our team and our pastors. But um, uh, we can't remove a service to our children worship with their family. I want my kids near me in a worship service. So I'm not asking you to come 10 or 11. I'm talking come 10 and 11. 10 and 11. We're going to get the word. We're going to take a break of fellowship. This place is going to become a place of prayer for 15 minutes or so. And prayer rooms, we're going to still do prayer rooms open before the 10 o'clock and all that. But, but that 15 minute break, this will be an, and we're going to start with prayer. We're going to go into worship, then the word, and we're going to respond to his word. How many know it's going to work and it's going to be powerful? It's going to be powerful. First of all, I want you to lift your hands toward me and pray for me because transitions are not easy. I want everybody to pray for me. I want you to lift your hands toward your pastor. Pray for me. It's not an easy decision, but it's right. Lord, I pray you'd help my mind and my spirit. I receive every prayer. We know it works. You can bring much rest and much health, oh God, to families. Because strong families make strong churches. Strong churches will make strong cities. As he leads us, Lord, I pray in the name of perfect peace. Perfect peace. 
I receive strength, oh God, from the prayer of your people, from you, oh Lord. The Bible says to pray for the leadership in our life. Hallelujah. Thank you for your prayers. But we've got cities that are dependent on us. You are an amazing people. Thank you. Thank you for always going the direction we went to reach a region. But we're not done. Look at your neighbor and say, we're not done. You're a part of something. Isn't it amazing? We have over a thousand people attending our church here in the U.S. I think that's amazing. I think, clap your hands and thank God for that. Amen. And we're impacting thousands and thousands around the world every week because of what you do and what you pray. Uh, I want you to lift your hands and I want you to tell the Lord. God, I'm asking for rest and peace in my spirit. Pray, God, I can follow peace in this. Lord, that we won't deal with guilt. But Lord, we'll deal with peace. That God, we can sit down as families and have family time. Spend some time with people we've been wanting to spend time with. Have some nights to ourselves so we can also have nights to pour into other people that need what you've given us. We feel your abundance. We feel your spirit. We're warriors for you. We're your children, oh God. We want to do your will. Now, Lord, I want us to all pray this. God, we pray that you would give us boldness to speak your word. We pray you would stretch forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Do you believe there's power in the name? I feel healing coming in here right now. Lift your hands and begin to rejoice with me. Come on, God is good. God is able. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.